Hello, and welcome to another Digital Differential Equations lecture video for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we are going to be going through Chapter 4.1 and discussing second order linear differential equations and the harmonic oscillator. In Chapter 4.1, we introduce a model to physics a model central to physics and engineering, the harmonic oscillator. This is a prototypic second order linear differential equation. We will derive the initial value problem describing mechanical vibrations and the behavior of electrical circuits. Formulating and solving problems related to these systems are stepping stones to understanding more complex models in biology, ecology, and meteorology. While electrical circuits are presented in Chapter 4.1, we will wait and cover them in Chapter 4.2. So as you go through your reading, you could, if you would like, pass over this material and save it till our next section. To get started, let's look at some definitions. A second order linear differential equation is of the following form, where A, B, and C, where constants, will have specific meanings depending on the application we look at. If f of t, the right hand side of the DE is zero, the DE is said to be homogeneous. In our work today, we will find that the general solution will be of the form C1Y1 plus C2Y2 where y1 of t and y2 of t will form a basis for the solution space. Remember, this means that all solutions will be able to be written as a linear combination of these solutions. If we're given an IVP, then we'll be have to given, be given an initial position, y, and an initial velocity, y prime then we will be able to solve for the specific constants C1 and C2. Now, our application of this second order linear DE will be the harmonic oscillator. A harmonic oscillator is a system that when displaced from its equilibrium, it undergoes a special type of motion. These include mass spring systems, small oscillations of a pendulum, and the alternating current in an electrical circuit. To help us visualize this, Consider a mass spring system that is displaced from equilibrium by pulling the system down and releasing it. So in our picture, the equilibrium position is where the mass spring system is at rest. So when you hang a mass from a spring, it comes to, mo to a stop, and, and this stopping place is the equilibrium. So now we're considering that we pull the mass down and then release it. So now it's starting from a position that is below equilibrium. And we want to imagine what will happen to this spring. Well, one way to look at this, I'm going to draw the best picture I can, is that when you release this spring, it's gonna to start to go back up, pass your equilibrium, reach maybe the top of its motion, 
come back down, reach the bottom of its equal uh, its position, and this and then this motion is going to keep going. This motion that we're trying to describe right now. is the motion of an undamped or frictionless motion. Notice that this is a theoretical and not realistic. I say that because all springs have some kind of friction present in them but it is a theoretical past that I think we understand well. I think in reality, when we let a spring go, what we might actually see is the spring being released from this position down at the bottom of its motion. It'll go up, but it won't go up as high as it did initially. And then it sort of comes back down. It might look something like this, where the amplitude decreases with each oscillation. So, I mean, springs don't bounce forever, they eventually stop. So here we're talking about then a damped or motion with friction. This is a more realistic expectation of motion. And I will get to talking about damped or frictionless or, or motion with friction eventually, but for now, let's just consider the undamped frictionless motion of a spring. And these are the motions that we would like to describe today. Now, before I get there, there's one more note I should make. When we're talking about the motion of a spring, physicists have adopted the convention that the downward direction is your positive direction. So keep this in mind as we go through the derivation and applications that we look at today. Okay, right, let's get started. To describe the motion of a spring mass system, let's recall Newton's second law of motion. So from a previous class, you probably somewhere heard that Newton's second law of motion is F equals MA. Now, I want to use Newton's second law of motion, but I'm going to change the order in, a way we, in the way I write this. I want to write it as MA, so put it on the left-hand side. And technically, when they say force, they're only talking about one force, but technically, there could be more than one force. So Newton's second law of motion should actually say it's the sum of all the forces that are present. So let's think about the forces that are present here. And let's also change our notation. Recall from calculus that when we talk about acceleration, acceleration is really your second derivative of position. So maybe we could write this as mx double dot and I use the double dot when we're talking about derivatives that are explicit with respect to time. This is a, an engineering and physics notation that we will commonly use. Okay, so the forces that are present on here. When you pull a spring 
you imagine the spring wants to always come back to its initial position. If you stretch a spring, it wants to compress again. If you compress a spring, it wants to go back outwards again. This is referred to as the restoring force of a spring. And a basic principle of linear springs is that the restoring force of a spring is opposite in direction and proportional to the amount the spring is stretched or compressed. So your restoring force. So let's put that one in here. I'm going to put it here in words first. This is your restoring force of a spring. Okay. There could also be a damping force. Here we will assume that a damping force is due to friction between the object and a table, if it's sliding horizontally, or maybe the object and the air resistance. It is always going to be proportional to the velocity and in the opposite direction. And a great example of this is when you consider driving your car down the freeway. If you stick your hand out the window, the force of the air pushes it opposite the direction you're traveling. The faster you're going, the faster it pushes it, or the harder it pushes it. So it's opposite in direction and proportional to your velocity. But for now, I'm just going to write it in words. And I want to call it your damping force. Okay, one more. There can also be some other external type of force, which is sometimes referred to as a driving force to affect your motion. This could be also something like wind pushing it, if you have a propeller, a magnetic field, or even a motor that's causing the vibrations. And I'm imagining maybe an electric shaver. So external forces. So if we now replace each of these forces with their mathematical descriptions, so again, your restoring force of a spring was opposite and proportional to the amount that you stretch it, x. Your damping force was opposite and proportional to your velocity. And then your external forces, like the force of a motor, could be represented by some function f of t that describes that external force. Now, this differential equation is commonly written in a standard form where all of the variable x is on the left-hand side of your dE. And this is going to be our second order linear differential equations. And notice that this matches the form that we presented on our first page. However, now our constants are, have taken on specific meanings to describe the motion of a spring. And our goal is to describe and understand this motion. However, to get there, we are going to start with looking at what is referred to as undamped 
and unforced motion. If our motion is undamped and unforced, then let's remove the damping term and remove the forcing term, such that our differential equation now becomes mx double dot plus kx equals zero. which if we wanted to, we could solve this for x double dot by moving the kx to the right side of the de, which would make it be a, a negative kx. And then we'll divide both sides by your mass to write it as negative k over m times x. I'm going to change how I wrote that x because I want it to be kind of in the middle. And then if we had an initial value problem, we'd have to be said, what is the motion or the position of your spring at time zero? And what is the velocity of your spring at time zero? Okay, I hope this makes sense. So now we try to want to imagine what do solutions of this initial value problem look like? This is our goal. We want to find solutions to the undamped, unforced motion of a spring. And again, let's consider what this looks like. Here we're looking at the red path. If you have an undamped, unforced, unforced motion of a spring, then you expect your spring to have oscillations with a constant amplitude. And this should look a lot like a sine or a cosine curve. So this is a good place to start. Because of the form of the solution curve, I think it's natural to expect maybe a solution could look like sine of t or cosine of t. And we also expect that the second derivative has to be some kind of a multiple of itself, a negative multiple of itself, where this negative k over m, we'll have to figure out what this is, but th these are constants. So this is a negative multiple of itself. So let's look at our sine curve for a minute, our sine function. What does the second derivative look like? So here we'll take the second derivative of the sine of t. And let's imagine if we take one of these derivatives and leave one behind, so take just one of the derivatives of sine of t is gonna be cosine of t. And if we take the second derivative, we do get negative sine of t. Similarly, if you took the second derivative of cosine of t, and I'll accomplish this by taking one derivative and leaving one behind, when you take the first derivative of cosine of t, you'll have negative sine of t. And take another derivative, you'll have negative cosine of t. So notice these are at least satisfying the requirement that the derivatives 
the second derivatives are negative multiples of itself. However, doesn't it account for the negative k over m? It doesn't account for this negative k over m that we have. Well, it accounts for the negative, just not the k over m. So we account for the k over m. Let's change our guess of what a solution should look like. Let's change our guess of what a solution should look like. And so instead, let's guess maybe a function of the form sine omega naught t or cosine of omega naught t. And this should be a good guess because if you recall from trigonometry, what does omega do to a, a cosine or sine curve? And what you should be thinking here is that your omega changes your period. So we're talking about a difference between a, a function that has a period that's longer or a function that has a period that might be much shorter and has more oscillations in it. This is what omega controls. Which may seem appropriate for the motion of a spring mass system. And let's verify what these second derivatives look like. So just like before, we'll take the second derivative of omega naught t. And when I take the second derivative, we're going to take one derivative and leave one derivative behind. When you take the first derivative of sine of omega naught t, that's going to be cosine omega naught t times by the chain rule, the derivative of the inside, which gives us the factor of omega naught that goes in front. We'll take a second derivative. The derivative of cosine of anything is going to be negative sine of the anything, so sine of omega naught t, times by the chain rule, the derivative of omega naught, which hits the other factor of omega naught that we had initially, and we get omega naught squared. Let's do the same thing for the cosine function. We'll look at the second derivative of cosine of omega naught t. And taking this derivative, we'll leave one derivative behind. Now recall the derivative cosine of anything is negative sine of the anything. So sine of omega naught t times by the chain rule, the derivative of this anything gives us a factor of omega naught that goes as a coefficient. Again, this is our first derivative, so we'll take another derivative. So we have negative omega naught is our coefficient, and the, sine, the derivative of sine is going to be cosine of the omega naught t times by the chain rule, the derivative of the anything gives us another factor of omega naught which I'll write in front with an exponent. So notice that these two functions both satisfy the property that the second derivative is a negative multiple of itself. The second derivative of cosine is a negative multiple of itself. So now let us compare with the DE. Remember our differential equation that we had said the second derivative had to equal 
negative k over m times itself. And so both of these functions satisfy that the second derivative is a negative multiple of itself. And so when we're comparing, we can actually say that the negative k over m has to equal the negative omega naught t that we see in the front of both of these. So negative k over m has to equal to the negative omega naught squared. Of course, the negatives will cancel. And we can solve for omega naught by taking a square root. And so we can say omega naught has to satisfy that it's the square root of k over m. If this is what we choose for omega naught, then these will be solutions to the differential equation. It actually gives us two different linearly independent solutions that are of the form x1 of t is cosine omega naught t, and a second solution is x2 of t, which is going to be sine omega naught t, where omega naught has to be the square root of k over m. And both of these will be solutions to this differential equation, the second derivative is a negative multiple of itself. Then we can say that the general solution by the superposition principle Which recall this the superposition principle says the sum of two solutions has to be a solution. Any constant multiple of a solution has to be a solution. This allows us to write our general solution as a linear combination of our solutions, which means x of t would have to be some c1 multiple of our first solution, cosine omega naught t, plus some C2 multiple of sine omega naught t. And this is what our general solution to the differential equation is going to look like. Now, I don't know about you, but it feels weird to me to write the solution of a harmonic oscillator. Remember, the, the, the harmonic oscillator was the motion of a spring that looks like this. Drawing my best cosine curve I can. And it feels weird to write this motion as the sum of two other trig functions. It, is, it does work, but it feels odd to write it that way. So we can also look at an alternate form of the solution. And so we can say the general solution can be written as a single trigonometric function of the form that looks like x of t is equal to a cosine omega naught t minus delta. Where A will describe your amplitude of motion, how high and how low the spring goes. Delta, your phase angle, this is related to your horizontal shift. P, 
is your period of motion, how long it takes to see one cycle as two pi over omega naught, and one over p as the frequency measured in oscillations per second. Now, this problem is developed, or this, this, this uh, rewriting is developed in problem number 44 in your homework. So I'm gonna leave out the derivation of why this is true, but we will note here that the derivation of this alternate formula is uh, guided in problem number 14 of your homework. Now to help you with this though, um, is commonly, or we commonly use another figure to help us with this derivation or this uh, this rewriting of a differential equation in this form, of our solutions in this form, excuse me. And we draw a little right triangle, and we put C1 on the horizontal uh, side, C2 on the vertical side. And then so A will be your hypotenuse. And by the Pythagorean theorem, we know that a squared is equal to c1 squared plus c2 squared, or a is the square root of the sum of these squares. And this will be your shortcut for remembering how to find your amplitude of motion in your alternate form of your solution. The delta, your phase angle, satisfies, if you put delta in this corner, that the tangent of delta, remember your tangent is your opposite over your adjacent sides, so that delta will always be the arctangent of C2 over C1. And again, this is, this is gonna give you a visualization to help us find this phase angle, which is part of your alternate form of your solution. Okay, let's look at an example. Consider a mass of two kilograms with a spring whose restoring force is given by eight newtons per meter. The spring is pulled down 0.1 meters and then released with an initial velocity of four meters per second. And we want to describe the motion of this spring. So here our starting point would be to recall that our differential equation has to be of the form your mass times your second derivative plus kx has to equal zero. But here we're given our mass is two kilograms, so 2x double dot, plus our spring constant k, eight newtons per meter, so eight x has to equal zero. Our initial conditions are it's pulled down 0.1 meters. So x of zero is equal to 0.1 meters. And remember when it's pulled down, remember we, our, 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 our physicists and engineers have uh, said that the downward direction is the positive direction. So I'm writing this as a positive 0.1. And our velocity, x dot of zero, has an initial velocity of four meters per second. So this is actually pulled down and then thrown down with a velocity that's even more. Actually, I think for this problem, I wanna change this. Let's change this to be negative. 
four meters per second. No, we'll just leave it. It's four meters per second. I'm fine with this. So it's, it's thrown down with an initial velocity that pushes it down more. Okay, so now to find our solution, we first find omega naught. And remember, omega naught is going to be the square root of k over m. Now our k, our spring constant was 8, divided by our mass, which is 2 kilograms. This will be then the square root of 4, or just 2. This will tell us then our general solution. We don't want to re-derive the wheel each time, or redevelop it, so we'll just jump to our general solution. Always has to look like x of t is c1 cosine of omega naught, so 2t, plus c2 sine of omega naught, so 2t. And this is our general solution. But we were given an IVP, so we just, let's go ahead and solve for these constants now. To solve for the IVP, we also need to have an equation on velocity. So you might want to identify when we write x of t here, this is a position function. Now we want to write a velocity function. So x dot of t. So let's take our derivative. Remember the derivative of c1 cosine of anything is going to be negative c1 sine of the anything times by the chain rule, the derivative of the anything, and I'll write that in front. Similarly, the derivative of c2 sine of anything is going to be c2 cosine of the anything times by the chain rule, the derivative of the anything, and I'll put that 2 in front. Now our or let me write this part down. This is our velocity function. And our initial condition said that x of 0 had to be 0.1 and x dot of 0 had to be 4. So let's evaluate our solutions at zero. So here we're going to have x of zero is going to be c1 cosine. And we plug in zero here. Zero times two is just zero. Plus c2 sine. When you plug in zero for t, that's just going to be zero. And our first derivative evaluated at zero will be negative 2c1 times the sine of zero plus 2c2 times the cosine of zero. Of course, you want to remember here that the sine of zero is always zero, so this whole term goes away. Similarly, the sine of zero is zero, so this whole term goes away. Also remember that the cosine of zero, this is one. So this is just C1, and this your derivative is going to be 2C2. But from our initial conditions, we knew this had to be 0.1 meters. This tells us C1 is just 0.1. 
and our first derivative had to equal four. If we're solving for C2, this tells us C2 has to just be two. This allows us to now write our solution to the IVP as x of t is equal to 0.1 cosine of 2t plus 2 sine of 2t. This is the solution to our IVP. Now again, I, it feels odd to me to write my solution in this form. I'm trying to imagine what the graph of this function, or the graph of this spring is going to look like. And it's hard to see that written as the sum of two trigonometric functions. So what I would like to now do is write this in the alternate form. And to write it in the alternate form, I'm going to start by drawing a little right triangle over here. Remember C1 goes on the horizontal axis, so this is point one. C2 goes on your vertical axis, so that's two. And in our alternate form, we need A, our amplitude of motion. But A is gonna equal the square root of the point one squared plus the two squared. And if you grab your calculator, I'm going to have uh, the square root of the 0.1 squared plus the 2 squared. Should give us an amplitude of motion of 2.002. .002. Our phase angle had to satisfy that the tangent of delta was C2 over C1, or that delta was going to be the arctangent of point, oh, not point two, two over point one. The arctangent of two divided by point one. So grab your calculator. Make sure you're in radian mode here. So I'm gonna hit my mode key at the top. Notice that I am in radian mode. All the answers in your homework do you do your answers in radians. So now I want the arc tangent of two divided by 0.1. And this gives me 1.52 arc tangent of 2 divided by 0 0.1 okay so now this allows me to write our answer in the alternate form this will have to look like x of t is equal to 2.002 .002 cosine of, remember it was going to be omega naught, which is 2t minus whatever our phase angle is, the 1.52. And this will be the alternate form of your solution. Now here it's worth a note about what your homework looks like. To help us with that, I would like to turn on our Canvas course for a minute. And if you were to go to the modules in Canvas, and let's scroll down to chapter 4.1, 
linear second order DEs and the harmonic oscillator. You'll note that I've broken your homework exercises into three groups here. The first group contains problems one through six, and then this, and then 23 through 28. And so it's not explicit in the instructions, but in one through six, you're intended to find the solution of your IVP of the form C1 cosine omega naught T plus C2 sine omega naught T. Then in problems 23, 24, 25, and 28, you're asked to determine the amplitude, phase, angle, and period of motion, which means that you want to have your solution written in the alternate form. You don't have to solve the differential equation again, you just have to rewrite it in the alternate form using the conversion formulas that I've shown you, which are also on page 200 of our textbook. Okay. Now we're at the bottom of page four in our guided lecture notes. I would like to stop this video here. I'm gonna make a second video where I get to do a couple more examples with you. However, this should give you the theory that you need for solving second order linear DEs and harmonic oscillator problems. But to look at a few more examples, we'll do that in the next video. So I'll see you then.